Exposing people uh, to um, images that are beneath conscious awareness um, is called subliminal priming. It's a standard technique that we use uh, both in social psychology and in cognitive psychology. Um, now, after the subliminal priming procedure, we ask the participants to perform um, an unrelated, a supposedly unrelated um, object detection task. And for this task, participants were presented with a series of objects that were severely degraded, okay? These objects appeared on the screen one at a time, and um, each was slowly brought into focus in a series of 41 steps, okay? So here's an example of this where there's an object that's completely degraded. I'm just showing you key points along the continuum here so that by the end you can clearly see what the object is. And the participant's goal this time is to indicate with a button push the moment at which they could recognize what that object was. Okay? Some of these objects were crime relevant, like guns and knives, and others were uh, crime irrelevant, like staplers and cameras. Okay? So the participants were either exposed to the black male faces or the white male faces or no faces at all, and then all of them did this object detection task on both the crime relevant and the crime irrelevant objects. And we hypothesized that the participants who were exposed to the black male faces initially uh, would need less time to uh, detect the crime relevant objects. So here um, are the results. Here, along the vertical axis, we have the frame number um, in the continuum at which they could recognize what that object was. That goes from frame one, where it's degraded, to frame 41, where it's completely clear. And the first thing we'll notice um, is that for the crime irrelevant objects, it makes no difference whether they're exposed to the black faces or the white faces or no faces beforehand. They're recognizing those crime irrelevant objects at about the same point um, in the continuum. But you get a really different pattern when you look at what they do for the crime relevant objects. So you can see here that simple exposure to the black faces beforehand drastically reduces the perceptual threshold at which they could recognize what those objects were. Okay, so they need a lot less information uh, to say, oh, that's a gun or that's a knife. And when we expose them to the white faces beforehand, you get the opposite effect. They need a lot more information. They need more clarity before they're able to say to you, oh, that's a gun or that's a knife, okay? So exposure to the black faces facilitated uh, the detection of these crime objects, whereas exposure to the white faces inhibited the detection of those very same objects. Now, uh, the next set of studies I want to present have to do with the issue of racial profiling. Um, so um, the idea here is that uh, when people think black, they think crime, and so the first study I just presented demonstrates this. But we, uh, my colleagues and I wanted to argue um, that the association works in the opposite way as well. So when people think about crime, they think about black people, okay? Thinking about crime draws uh, attention to black Americans. Under these conditions, uh, black people are um, placed under surveillance. So I'm gonna give you an example of this. This is another study my colleagues and I conducted with white male undergraduates. Um, this time, half of the participants were subliminally primed uh, with crime objects on the computer screen, and here it is in slow motion. Um, and um, next, the participants were asked to uh, complete a dot probe task, okay? And so for the dot probe task, uh, they were um, shown on a computer screen a black face and a white face simultaneously. This time, they were shown the faces long enough to be detected. Those faces came on the screen, and then they disappeared, and a dot appeared where one of the faces used to be, okay? And the participant's goal was to simply uh, locate that dot on the computer screen as quickly as possible. Tell us whether that dot was to the left or the right um, of the computer screen, okay? Um, and we hypothesized that when that dot was in the location of the black face, um, the participants who had been exposed to these crime objects beforehand would be faster at finding that dot than those who had not been exposed to those images. So the idea is that once we get people to think about crime, they'll begin to look at the black face, and we use the speed at which they could find this dot as a proxy for visual attention. The faster they are finding that dot, the more likely it is that they're showing an attentional bias in that direction the whole time. Okay, so uh, here are the results uh, here for this study. We have along the vertical axis the mean reaction time to locate that dot on the computer screen. 
And the first thing we're going to do is to look at uh, what happens when they're not primed with any crime image, images at all. And you can see here um, that they're faster to locate the dot um, when that dot is placed near the white face than when it's placed near the black face, okay? So they're faster to locate that dot because they're looking at the white face, okay? So when there's no manipulation at all, there's an in-group bias going on where white faces are attracting white study participants. Now, uh, when the uh, students are primed to think of crime, um, we get just the opposite effect, okay? Uh, they look at the black face. Um, so as expected, exposing uh, people to the crime-relevant objects place the black uh, male faces under surveillance. Now, we repeated this study with police officers. Um, so the question here is, when police officers are on the lookout uh, for criminal activity, when they're thinking about violent crime, will this lead them to focus on black faces? Um, so this study is quite similar to the study I just showed you, but in this case, we primed half of the police officers with words associated with violent crime rather than images. So we exposed these officers to words like apprehend, arrest, capture, shoot. And you can see here that the pattern um, of results is, is identical to what we see with the students, okay? When the police officers are, um, are encouraged to think of arresting and shooting and capturing, they're drawn to the black face. Now, at the very end of the study, uh, we took police officers through a surprise face identification task. We presented them with a black lineup and a white lineup, and we simply asked them to pick out the face that they were shown earlier in the study. Now here's the black lineup. Um, one of these faces we actually used in the real study with the officers, um, and it's also the face that I showed you in an earlier slide when I first um, introduced the study. Um, how many people know which is the target face? Is it, how many people think it's four? Okay, so the correct answer is number four. So that's pretty good. Better than a lot of the police officers, actually. <laughs> um, but oh, well, they, the police officers actually were able to do this ta uh, task at above chance levels, so they could identify the target at above chance levels. But when they made a mistake on this task, the, the errors that they they made were systematic. Um, so what happened um, was, oh, let me explain. Um, we chose two of these faces uh, to put in this lineup because they were rated by a separate group of study participants as more stereotypically black than the target. So those were faces two and three. Um, and then the other two faces were placed in the lineup because they were rated as less stereotypically black than the target. So those are faces one and five. And what happened is when the, uh, the officers made an error on this task and they were primed to think of crime, they thought they saw face number three or they thought they saw face number two. Okay? So these results could have implications for eyewitness testimony. Black people who appear most stereotypically black may be the most vulnerable to false identifications in real lineups. Now, results like these could also have implications for sentencing decisions. Uh, in the next study I'm going to present, my colleagues and I were interested in how physical appearance could influence death sentencing decisions. 